coming up on Network Africa. ECOWAS sanctions on Mali questionable as the country recall ambassadors. UN humanitarian aid agencies stop work in Tigray after Friday's airstrikes. Plus, 10 people killed by floods, hundreds homeless in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoki. Let's begin with stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend. Protesters in Sudan are not relenting on their demand for civil rule as Mali is hit with new sanctions from regional body ECOWAS. Perhaps the highlight of the weekend is the opening match at the Africa Cup of Nations in Cameroon. The host country beats Burkina Faso 2-1 to claim the first three points of the tournament. In state regional bloc ECOWAS announced that West African nations will close borders with Mali, sever diplomatic ties, and impose tough economic sanctions in response to its delay in holding elections following a 2020 military coup. The fresh measures represent a significant hardening of its stance towards Mali, whose interim authorities have proposed holding elections in December 2025 instead of this February, as originally agreed with the bloc. As much as we are aware of the complex situation of the country, we think that all political, economical and social reforms looking to reshape Mali can only be headed by democratically elected authorities. Que par des autorités démocratiquement élues. In a communique issued after an emergency meeting in the Ghanaian capital Accra, ECOA says it found the proposed timetable for a transition back to constitutional rule totally unacceptable. Still on Sunday, Sudanese security forces fired tear gas at activists protesting in their thousands against the country's military rulers. Thousands of demonstrators marched from Ombudorman to Bari, two cities adjoining the capital Khartoum, chanting slogans denouncing military leader Abdul Fattah al burhan who took power in a coup in October 25 that upended a transitional power-sharing deal with civilians. On Saturday, video from a hospital in Ethiopia's Tigray region shows survivors of an airstrike, including children, being treated. Two aid workers say the strike in the town of Dedibet, in the northwest of the region near the border with Eritrea, occurred late on Friday night, January 7th. According to the aid workers, the airstrike in Ethiopia's Tigray region killed 56 people and injured 30 others. And finally, celebrations erupted outside Yaoundé's Olembe Stadium on Sunday as host Cameroon came from behind to beat Burkina Faso 2-1 in the opening match of the Africa Cup of Nations tournament. Burkina Faso, who were without their coach Kamu Malo and six others who tested positive for COVID, gave two who tested positive for COVID-19, gave away two clumsy penalties after Gustavo Sangari had silenced the home crowd, estimated at around 45,000, at the newly built Olembe Stadium with the first goal of the game. To our main stories for today, the United Nations has suspended operations in a zone of Ethiopia's northern Tigray region where dozens of people were reportedly killed in an airstrike last week. The UN's humanitarian agency says the ongoing threats of drone strikes has left them with little choice but to halt their activities. Aid workers over the weekend said that 56 people had been killed and dozens more injured in an airstrike on a camp for the displaced. It comes as the Tigray People's Liberation Front spokesperson accuses Eritrea of launching fresh attacks against the group's fighters, although Eritrea has not responded to these accusations. 
Ethiopian government forces, boasted by Eritrean troops, have been fighting rebels in Tigray for more than a year now in a war that has killed thousands of people. Doctors in Sudan say two people have died and dozens of others were injured on Sunday in Sudan's capital Khartoum in the latest round of demonstrations against October's military coup. One was set to be hit on the head by tear gas canister and the other died from a brain hemorrhage. Well, and a doctor's organization allied to the protest movement called the Central Doctors Committee says 63 people have now been killed since the coup. As part of efforts in solving the political crisis, the United Nations says it is trying to start talks in Sudan to resolve the situation and also to ensure there is a transition to democracy. At the start of January, Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok resigned as a civilian prime minister amid continuing friction between the military and pro-democracy campaigners. West African leaders continue their call for a return to civilian rule in Mali and they're making their stance clear as they have imposed sanctions on the country. This is coming after the country's military government announced the long delay to the elections that were originally planned for February. The West African regional bloc ECOWAS, which met in Accra on Sunday, they've agreed to close borders with Mali as well as implement a range of economic sanctions but the military government in Mali has responded, saying that it will be closing its land and air borders with ECOWAS, and it's also recalling its ambassadors from member states. In a statement, the Junta says it strongly condemns what it terms illegal sanctions imposed on the country. Mali's military rulers now say elections could take place in December 2025 instead of next month as originally agreed, and now this delay the West African bloc deems unacceptable. Well, joining us now for more discussions on this is Olushe Yadeyemo, a public affairs analyst. Thank you so much for speaking to us on Network Africa. So it appears more sanctions for Mali from ECOWAS and the military, it looks like they're testing the resolve of the regional leaders. How effective do you think this would be in compelling the government back to elections? First of all, I'm particularly happy that uh, ECOWAS, um, in a very, very long time, are standing up to their responsibility uh, to ensure that we have our lives, you know, better in West Africa. As a West African, I'm happy that ECOWAS have decided to take this step. Because, you see, the truth is, any human being or group of people that are not regulated, that are given the room to do whatever they like, would always misbehave. Um, it said that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so I'm happy that ECOWAS decided to step up to, to, to their billing and they have decided to put a sanction so that it can show to any of us, whether it's Nigerian, Ghana, Mali, or whoever, that you cannot just do whatever you like to the detriment of your people. And so, yes. Um, whatever must be done, must be done. I'm happy that they, they are not just bringing up the sanction. They're already calling on AU. They're calling on EU. They're calling on um, United Nations. And they, will, they should please continue until they're able to impress it on the junta that they cannot stay in power because they are illegal. They are promised an 18 months transition is going to be over next month. And whatever must be done, must be done to ensure that they are kicked out of office so that we can have a democratically elected government back in place in Mali. Well, like you've just mentioned, the uh, military is saying they won't be able to hold elections in February and the elections could even take place in December 2025. From now till then, do you think what, what else do you think ECOWAS can do perhaps to fast track election day? I mean, like I said earlier, it is time for them to hold their own, make sure that they impress it on the rest of the world. Because COVID-19 has taught all of us that whatever happens to one happens to all. Now, we cannot afford as West Africans to stay like we've always stayed on the fence, 
and allow all of these people do what they are doing to the detriment of not just Malians, but the rest of all. Because at the end of the day, when things go bad there, it will affect all of us in one way or the other. So I want to plead with um, EU as they call on them that they should also please help us make sure that sanctions are slammed on Mali. We want to also call on African Union so that the rest of Africa will stand and say, look, we're in this together. We do not agree with a junta being in power more than the 18 months that you have asked for. You have asked for 18 months and we're not doing any other thing other than to put a transition in place so you cannot come now at the tail end to say you want three more years to do what to, we cannot afford it. So I expect that ECOWAS will stand their ground and at the end of the day, whether February or sometime later, we will be able to get them out of office. The thing is, we've never been this far. So now that we're being fan, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to get them out of office as soon as possible. Well, Mali isn't taking this lightly. They've responded and, you know, they're reacting to these sanctions. They're going to close the land and air borders with ECOWAS countries. They've also recalled, you know, they're recalling their ambassadors from member states. What do you make of this? I mean, the truth of the matter is I don't expect them to pull their hands. The truth is because they know the regulation. And I must confess that, I mean, this is the first time. All of us, we've always been very careless in the way we deal with these regional blocks. But for the first time, apart from the time that ECOMOG rose to the occasion in Liberia, this is the first time this is being done, and I'm particularly happy. So, yes, they can call in their ambassadors already. Um, the rest of the um, uh, ECOWAS Commission is saying, look, we're going to call in our own ambassadors as well. They're going to say, we will not want to do business with you. Of course, they, they, they're doing a, um, a line. They're saying uh, concerning uh, food and all the things that they consider will be necessary for the well-being of Malians. We're not going to clamp down on that, but whatever, and particularly the assets of those who are involved in this and whether assets and all of that in the UMO, we are going to clamp down on it. And so for me, the, the thing is, regulation is necessary. What was wrong before was that the regulation was not, you know, was not stringent enough. So it is a welcome development, and I pray and hope that at the end of the day, if ECOWAS is very far with this, we will be able to see a situation where we are starting a good precedent in West Africa and come to think of it in the whole of Africa going forward so that some of these people who feel that it could just come into power and just seize power and at the end of the day decide on how long they're going to stay in power will not do it again because they know that the rest of West Africa, the rest of Africa and the rest of the world will rise to the internet. All right then, thank you so much, Public Affairs Analyst Olusheyi Adeyemo. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Greece has donated about 1 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to Nigeria to boost vaccination in the country. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Nikolaos Dendias, disclosed this during a meeting with his Nigerian counterpart, Mr. Jeffrey Oyama in Abuja. He says Nigeria and Greece have enjoyed a favorably favorable relationship over the years and that his country is even willing to expand the relationship which will culminate in the signing of a memorandum of understanding on various issues. Earlier, Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jeffrey Oyema, said Nigeria has also enjoyed partnership with Greece in the area of defense and expresses the willingness of the current government to partner with Greece in the areas of agriculture and infrastructure. Still to come on the program. It's back to school for children in Uganda as schools reopen after almost two years. Please stay with us for more details. Welcome back to the program.
Floods around South Africa's eastern coastal city of East London have killed at least 10 people and left hundreds homeless since the weekend. Rivers bust their banks and roads were inundated as vehicles tried to drive through torrents of water that had submerged highways. Hundreds of homes are said to have been washed away in the iron roof informal settlements that's just outside the city, especially the Mansani township. Scientists suspect that climate change is the cause of worsening floods and droughts along the country's eastern coastline, where the city of roughly half a million lies. We are happy to report that since this recent incident, we have intervened uh, by dispatching uh, food parcel, by giving out food parcels to the affected communities, giving sh temporary shelters to people who lost everything, including those who lost their loved ones during this disaster. Schools in Uganda have fully reopened today, almost two years after the coronavirus pandemic started. Well, this has been one of the world's longest closures since the virus forced governments to close learning institutions back in March 2020. According to Education Minister John Muyingo, about 15 million pupils who have not attended school since would now automatically resume classes a year above where they left off. Mr. Muyingo also adds that any private schools demanding fees above pre-pandemic rates would be sanctioned. Zara Namuli is a Ugandan journalist with the MBS TV. She joins us now for more on this. Hello, Zara. Thank you for speaking to us. Well, millions of children have now returned to school after almost two years. Tell us, how did resumption go across the country? Thank you so much. It was day one to many learners who were reporting to school after two whole years. It was excitement to many, but of course for the kindergartens, many of them, it was tears as they were either reporting to school for the very first time or reporting to new schools because many of them had um, been promoted. It has, uh, the traffic has been so uh, overwhelming because um, even when the Minister of Education had decided that uh, students should not report to school on the same day, uh, these were going to report, to report to school in a staggered manner. Congestion has been the order of the day in the capital, Kampala, and several other areas uh, where students were reporting to school because we understand not all students actually do study from the capital. Some go to districts like Masaka, some go to Jinja, some go to the western part of uh, Uganda, that is Mara and all that. So that's how day one has been. But at least what we know is that uh, learners and parents responded um, to the long-term call of having them, uh, the, the children, back to school. On day one, uh, most people actually did report. Well, there are concerns now that, you know, the students might struggle to adapt after falling so far behind. Are there measures in place to help these children adapt? Because, you know, like you've mentioned, the Education Ministry is allowing all students to automatically resume classes a year above where they left us left off how will this impact the kids uh, from the Ministry of Education if somebody was in P1 they automatically go to P2 and those who are in a senior one will automatically go to senior two so to make sure that the learners do fit into the new education system uh, the curriculum has been revised to mean that uh, all learners who will be in P2 uh, for example, primary two, will be covering the workload for primary one as well, because these, uh, these kids are assumed to have had an automatic promotion. Then those who are in senior two will automatically go to senior three, but the new curriculum has been revised in a manner that uh, they will be um, having lessons uh, that, that they would have had in senior, uh, in senior two as well. So the Minister of Education says the Ugandan National Examinations Board is equally in sync. That means that they will be examining learners that have had an automatic promotion. So these learners cannot um, 
gets exams like for students who have gone through all the classes the normal classes maybe if i can say so in the past two weeks when the learners report there's going to be orientation to make sure that some of them who had forgotten about school um, are reoriented into the school system we've had many of the ugandan learners um, adopt to social media life we've had many of them on tiktok or twitter and all those other platforms many of them have uh, grown very huge following so to have such a learner get to school and immediately begin studying uh the minister of education says it will be hard so what they are doing is the learners will have a two weeks phased reorientation to bring them at par with the school system then in the third week they'll begin studying all right, just finally, talk to us about other measures in place to, you know, ensure safety while in school. Yes, uh, we, we understand that all schools are going to have a team of seven people that will include um, the students and the pupils. Their role will be to identify uh, their colleagues who have COVID-like symptoms. These cases will be reported and immediately screened and if positive, isolated and treated to limit infections, uh, because this is what led to the school's closure, uh, leaving schools closed for the last uh, two years. Then we also have a team of um, citizen-led initiatives that are saying that um, the government needs to adopt um, regular testing of students using the cheaper rapid antigen tests. Uh, this can be done maybe after every two weeks or after every three weeks to make sure that um, they do identify the positives, the symptomatic ones, and those, all of them to make sure that um, the infections are limited. This cannot be avoided. The children will obviously fall sick, at least according to the Minister of Education and, and the Minister of Health. They say the infections will be there, but they're doing all they can to make sure that these are limited, at least as of now. So as learners report, some schools were actually forcing parents to have their children um, report with a negative PCR test done 72 hours before the children report to school. This has been um, contested by the parents and the public as well. While government has said this should not be done, some learners have actually gone back to school with a negative PCR result because it was a recommendation from their schools. So we hope this will help in limiting infections among students in schools and keeping schools safe and open. All right, then. Thank you so much, Zara Namuli, Ugandan journalist in Kampala. Thank you. Police in Kenya say they've arrested 91 people believed to be Ethiopian nationals suspected to be in the country illegally. The Directorate of Criminal Investigations, DCI, says the group was arrested at a house in Kintingela outside Nairobi. All men are said to be below the age of 25 and had attempted to break out of the house where they were being held. Tens of undocumented Ethiopians are routinely arrested in Kenya every year after arriving to look for jobs or in transit to other countries. In October, police arrested 14 Ethiopian nationals, four adults and 10 children suspected to be in Kenya illegally. Let's talk sports now. The Super Eagles of Nigeria will begin their campaign for fourth title at the African Cup of Nations when they face seven-time champions Egypt on Tuesday at the Rumde Adja Stadium in Garua, Cameroon. Nigeria will look to improve on their 2019 performance when they finish third at the competition held in Egypt. Players and officials of the Super Eagles of Nigeria arrived at Garo International Airport in Cameroon to begin their quest for a fourth title at the Africa Cup of Nations. The Super Eagles will kickstart their campaign against the continent's most successful side at the Afghan Pharaohs of Egypt on Tuesday at the Rumde Adja Stadium in northern city of Garoua. The three-time African champions have not had a smooth build-up owing to late arrivals to camp by some invited players and last-minute withdrawals of key players to injuries and health issues. It calls for worry, but I think that um, by and large they are used to the team. Um, the blending process had been on for a very long time, so 
Uh, it's nothing new. We should have ordinarily have had, um, if we had one full week together, that would have been better. But all the same, uh, the boys are not new to themselves, so I think that uh, we can cope with whatever challenges we have. These issues have lowered the expectations of Nigerians on the chances of the team to emerge champions at the end of the competition. Egypt is not a pu uh, pushover. Anytime, any day, northern, North African countries give us problems. But I tell you, it's, a very, it's the first game um, in, the, in, in, the, in the group and it's going to be a tough one. I think it's going to be a draw. I'm looking forward to a score draw, maybe something like 1-1. One, one. They've been one of the, you know, the best side in Africa, but you know, I feel Nigeria, with the quality we've got, uh, they should be able to you know, um, upset you know, uh, the first of Egypt in that one. At worst, get a draw. If we can, if we can get a win, it's fantastic offer, but at least a draw in the end of that. The expectations for a fourth title after nine years means interim Eagles boss Austin Aguavon will need to weave the magic wand in Cameroon. Well, we wish the Super Eagles all the best. That's it on the program today. Thank you for watching. I'm Layo Adigoki.